Welcome to Solid Ground. I just want to say thank you for joining us. Our church is a community of people simply trying to follow Jesus. We believe that when we encounter Jesus, our lives are forever changed. The lifelong journey of following him is an experience of receiving his love and grace and sharing that with everyone we meet. That is our hope for you today. So no matter whether you're checking us out for the very first time or if you call Solid Ground home, we pray that God meets you in a powerful way through our time together today. This morning, I want to share with you two things that I'm excited about that are happening around here. First, have you ever had one of those moments where you were working on a project and you just couldn't get it to move? You tried something and you had to start over and then you tried something else and no matter what you tried, you always kept coming back to square one. It's so frustrating. We, we've had a project like that. It's a small water leak in the roof over our nursery. And every time we thought we had it fixed, it kept coming back. Just like Chinese water torture, drip, drip, drip. Then this week, something amazing happened. We, we've been trying to get a professional roofer out here to fix it once and for all. And after waiting many months, they showed up to take a look at it and give us an estimate. After looking at it, they were able to quickly diagnose it. And then they said they could even fix it that same day. What's even crazier is the cost was more reasonable than I thought. And I just really felt like God was smiling down on us. And we really value our kids around here. And nothing says we don't value you like a slow water leak in the nursery every time it rains. I am so grateful for this breakthrough. We really do want to see our nursery as a place where kids can experience the love and grace of God in a warm and welcoming environment. And so I'm just so grateful for this breakthrough and this way in which that was able to happen. Speaking of investing in the next generation, one of the ways in which our church is helping to disciple the next generation is through our very own ministry at Alta Loma Christian School. And I wanted to let you know that on February 15th, they will be having their next open house and first day of enrollment for all new families for next school year. So if you know of anyone who is looking for a truly great education with a Christ-centered focus, then please encourage them to attend and sign up today. They can find out more about the school and about the open house at alchristian.com. I don't know if you know this, but outside one of our school buildings, someone wrote in the concrete decades ago when this school and church were founded, the scripture verse that says, let the little children come to me. Those were the words of Jesus. And I want to say a big thank you to each of you for all the ways that you're helping to make this a reality. You're living this out through your prayers and financial support. Without you, we wouldn't be able to do this. You're helping to see lives changed and you're making a difference in our church, in our nursery, in our school, and in our community. So if that's something that you're interested in, please check out the link below and go to our website at sgbic.com to learn more about how you can make a difference and invest in God's kingdom. Now, won't you join me in prayer as we continue in worship? Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. I thank you for all of the ways, in big and small ways, that you are moving in our world and in our lives and right here in our church. And so, Lord God, I pray that you would begin to speak and move in ways that we see you moving. God, do something fresh and new in our lives today. We give you this time, we give you our worship, and we give you everything this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain shadow your love surrounds me oh there's nothing to fear now 
When I was a kid, I inherited this beautiful tin lunchbox with the likeness of the Dukes of Hazard cast on it. Now, I was too young to watch Dukes of Hazard on TV. Maybe there was reruns, and I know I caught a couple of commercials, but I liked the lunchbox because I'd seen this car flying through the air while people yelled yee-haw. And I knew some of the broad strokes of the show that, that there were these cousins, Bo and Luke Duke, who were the drivers of the car. Oh, and they slid across the hood. I thought that was cool. I'd seen that in a commercial. They had a cousin named Daisy. And for some reason, my mom had me turn the channel every time she came on the, on the screen. And I also knew on the lunchbox was their wise Uncle Jesse, who was kind of this sage type figure, though I wouldn't have described it that way when I was a little kid. Another thing I remember is that, that the theme song said, they're just good old boys. They don't mean harm. And something to the effect of, like, they're on the wrong side of the law, which in Hazard County 
was Boss Hogg. I mean, my goodness, that white suit. No one could rock a white suit like Boss Hogg. And he had the, the long car with the horns on it. And then his sheriff, Roscoe P. Cotrain. Uh, I, I thought he was funny, kind of the, the bumbling type. And for some reason, Bo and Luke Duke, they could just never stay on the right side of the law. Then they would, they, they didn't mean harm at all, but the, the rules imposed and the system imposed by Boss Hogg and enforced by the sheriff, that ah, was just too much. And I, I got the feeling like the show wanted us to just give Bo and Luke a, a free pass at life, which uh, for us brings up questions of how do we relate to our governmental authorities? Because I know that's exactly what the writers of the show want us to ask. A deep exploration of our relationship to the government, especially as Jesus followers. Well, welcome to our second week of talking about politics. This year of all years, we got to talk about it, and I want to stay close to the scriptures. I don't want to offer you my ideas. I want us, my dream is that we would explore these concepts together, that this this YouTube video wouldn't be the last word on the subject. This is meant to be something that sparks conversation. And we, we explore what scripture has to say to us as Jesus followers and how we relate to our governmental authorities. And last week, you can watch the, the, the YouTube or, or it's on podcast as well. Last week, our main idea was Jesus is Lord. And if Jesus is Lord, then everything else is secondary. And this week is a continuation of that. And we're going to deal with two passages. So if, you're, uh, if you've are if you got your Bible ready or, or just to give you a little warning shot, we're going to be in Romans chapter 13 and also in 1 Timothy chapter 2. So a little bit of background about Romans, the, this letter of Rome, uh, Romans. Uh, uh, Rome was the seat of power in the first century in the in the empire and and everyone who lived there and everyone especially at this time that Paul is writing to these people the pressure was to claim that Caesar is our lord and savior that was the claim that was the the uh, the peer pressure around and Paul keeps writing to these Christians all over the Roman empire in different letters no 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 he he uses the term Jesus is lord so as these letters circulate, as these teachings circulate, as people, as the as the the pressure starts to mount for Jesus followers, there's more skin in the game for these people. Uh, they start to ask, "Okay, okay, if Jesus is Lord, then do we owe Caesar anything at all?" And that's part of the questions that Paul is 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 writing to these folks, this group of believers. So, in Romans chapter 13, let's pick it up in verse one. Paul says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from the fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. There's a lot of ideas in those first seven verses there. And Paul writes, we, I, I feel like I say this all the time, but if you're, if, uh, if you're new to this text, 
this isn't refresher to you, Paul writes in very fancy, complicated Greek. And sometimes it translates into awkward English. So let's take a moment to break down some of these thoughts that, that we just read. So Paul writes about the role of government in our world and the role of Christ followers in response to whatever government is in power. So, according to this text, the government is God-given. This, uh, uh, this text says that, that governments, in general, honor those people who do right, and in general, governments punish people who do wrong. So, it's God-given. Let's, let's explore that for a minute. What does it mean that God gives a government? Verses 1 and 2 in the passage we just read. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So, here we go. In, in those scriptures, and then in verse 4 and 6, there are there are three times government is referred to as God's servants. Sometimes that's a little hard to swallow, especially if you follow the news and, and regardless of your political persuasion. When I say, ooh, it's hard to swallow that government officials are God's servants, there's some of you that think of some politicians and go, nope, nope, nope. And then there's others of you who watch this that say, oh, nope, I'm thinking of someone else. No, nope, no, nope, that, that's hard to believe. So, no matter your persuasion, let's, let's approach this as objectively as possible. Keep in mind that, that this is Rome. People are, like, not just the Roman Empire, this is the center of it all, Rome of the Roman Empire. And it's not organized like the USA was, like for the people, by the people. In the system of government Paul was functioning in, Rome had an emperor, and everyone in the empire was subject to the whim of one man. People had, they had no power, basically. They had, maybe they had a little bit of power, there's like a republic kind of a thing. In general, people had no power back then. And so if, if these first two verses that Paul's talking about, saying that governments are God-given, Maybe some of us struggle with hearing that. And if you struggle with the choices that we have, imagine having no choice at all. I can't, it, it's still hard for me to think about in Paul's day, in a Roman context, he says, government is God given. Now, mind you, he didn't say God endorsed, he didn't say all governments are God's favorite way to organize people. What Paul is saying here is, at the very least, God has allowed whatever government is in place to be in place. Even the worst government winds up serving God's plan eventually. And I don't know how to connect those dots, but I know God is a master at doing those spiritual judo moves and taking what the enemy meant for evil and turning it around for good. So, this happens especially when a, a government or whatever the people are in power, when they don't mean to advance God's mission, that's God's specialty reversing their plans. So Paul is saying, in all of this, the government is God's servants. And, and here's what they do. They honor those who do what's right, and they punish those who do wrong. So what they're doing is they're maintaining order. So what, Mike? What, what difference does that make? I think that's a, there's a deep thought here. And the way I read this is that it's not God's will that chaos and anarchy are just the way things are. Nope. No. For God, a terrible government is better than no government at all. For God, he's close to those who suffer. He, he's close to those who are oppressed. But even in a Roman context, I mean, think... Think about this. Paul wasn't very far away from Christians fed to lions, human torches at Nero's party, uh, Christians hanging on crosses. That's the context Paul is 
giving advice in to these new Jesus followers. So, we go back to our original question. How do Christ followers respond to our authorities? The Apostle Paul says we do what's right. Not to get a merit badge, not to, not to, not even just to, to say, hey, everybody, look at how righteous I am. We do what's right because it's the right thing to do. Because even the worst government will appreciate some of what you do if you do right. You don't have to turn there, but in, in Paul's letter to the Galatians, in five, chapter, five, chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, he talks about the fruits of the Spirit and all of these. Uh, if you've ever worked in children's ministry, maybe you've memorized the list with the song. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then at the end, Paul says all that, that list of those good things, he says, against such things, there's no law. So think about you know, doing right just because we're really pleasing our highest authority, God. That's who we're living for. So think about what kind of government would outlaw love and joy. It's a pretty dark one. <laughs> then there's a whole other set of circumstances and a whole other set of questions to ask. Think about what kind of government would ban self-control. Maybe there's a government that would outlaw patience. Maybe, it'd be pretty far gone. What about a government that said, we need to put a stop to kindness and gentleness? I think Paul's advice in his letters, pretty good advice, no matter how your country, maybe you're not in the same context I am, maybe you're watching from somewhere else in the world. Uh, Paul's advice is relevant to all of us. And he says that governments actually want people with these qualities, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. I think every country, every country could use groups of Christians that are having, that are, that are experiencing that fruit in their life and not just to fly under the radar. Not just, well, we'll be good and we'll mind our own business and, and we'll, we'll, uh, We'll be good and hopefully no one will disturb our peace. So back to Romans chapter 13 and verse 5. He said, Therefore, it's necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. If you're following along in a paper Bible, just underline that word conscience. Paul's saying, let's do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. This is about the heart, not just the actions. And then he continues. He says, This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. I say this with a big smile on my face. Paul says, pay your taxes. And don't get mad at me. You can get mad at the scripture here. Now, Paul, it seemingly, uh, some could say, Paul is affirming the existence of the IRS. <laughs> Paul's, Paul, really, it's more than just the outward stuff. There's, there's a heart here that Paul's talking about, saying, hey, we're going to, we're going to honor. We're going to give people what they're due. Uh, Jesus even said it. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. And, and I can almost, I'm not telepathic, but I know just because I'm human and because I interact with, with, so many, with, with people, and just the, the people response is, hold on a minute. What if I don't approve of what my government stands for? Do I still pay my taxes? Well, just back up a little bit. You could rewind a little bit. Remember, this is first century Rome. This is a, a thing, a, a, a system, an empire that stands for almost everything contrary to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And still, Paul says, give what you owe. Even further, Paul has this idea he's saying, give. And not, it's not enough just to give while you're grumbling. Here's my taxes. 
Paul uses words like submit. He uses words, heart words, like honor. These are attitude words. Because a government can only make you obey at best. A government, can they can make you comply. Doesn't mean the government has your heart. And a government can't make you have a good attitude. And I, I'm not putting that on anybody. Government can't make you have a good attitude about paying your taxes or what, whatever you owe. Paul's challenging Jesus followers, even to the, you know, by extension, us, these people. And then we find ourselves asking, what do we do? How do we respond? And Paul is saying, choose to give your governmental authorities what is owed them. So taxes are one thing, but also respect and honor because it's good for your heart. It doesn't mean you condone everything, the whatever government stands for, at whatever level, city, county, state, national. But it also reminds me of the proverb, guard your heart. For it's, the, it's the wellspring of life. So a little question for you. And I am letting you off the hook. You don't have to put the answer to this in the comments. You don't have to. This is just between you and God. What's your attitude towards the governing authorities over you? Would Paul, if you were to sit down and have coffee with Paul and you were going over what he meant and what he was inspired by God to write down, what challenges would he have for you when it comes to your attitude towards the governing authorities? And I'll leave that with you. And while you're thinking about that, turn a couple of pages over to the letter of 1 Timothy chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, it says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. I've never caught this before still. I, I started studying this scripture in, in, uh, in context with Romans uh, chapter 13. Paul uses four different words for prayer in regards to government. Petitions, prayers, intercessions, thanksgiving, Pray for the government in different ways. Petitions, pray for them, lift them up. Oh, stand in the gap for them. The Thanksgiving one, even with the best of governments, that's like, really? We're supposed to be thankful for that? But hey, God doesn't want chaos to reign. He wants things to be orderly. And verse two in that passage we just read, for the kings and all in authority, they need prayer. They need your prayers. They need your prayers for petition and intercession and, and, and good grief. Like if, if scripture is the authority in our lives, it's, and it's saying, this is a command here, it's saying to thank God for the government. When's the last time you thanked God for the government? <laughs> wow. And so, so if, obviously this is important to the apostle Paul four times, four different words for pray. Why do we pray? And we find the answer for that in verses two through four. And it's not because you like the government so much. We are not commanded to pray for the government so you and I will be happier. We're not commanded to pray for the government so they'll just do what we want them to do. We pray for them so ultimately we'll be free to follow Jesus. We pray and intercede and, and pray that eyes will be opened. And we pray that we're thankful for a government so that people will be saved ultimately. We pray for our leaders so people will know the truth. And we pray so we can be the church and get about doing the business of, of the Father's work. We pray so we can bring the kingdom of God to make it on earth as it is in heaven. Is Jesus followers we should be 
so much more concerned about God's kingdom and its work in the world than we're concerned with who's in power in a particular government, in a particular place, in a particular time. It's important. We're in the middle, we're, we're starting. It's already gaining inertia. We're, we're in an election cycle. It is important, but don't forget what the most important government is. And it helps to keep a perspective. Uh, to, when we know who the ultimate authority is, we're not, like the Apostle Paul says, tossed to and fro by different doctrines or people trying to, to prey on our fears or, or, or even a righteous concern. So, what if Jesus' followers could be more concerned with God's kingdom? What if we were more concerned with what God wants than what any particular government is doing in the world at any particular time? If Jesus is Lord, then the kingdom of God is more important. Here's a thought exercise for you. Just think, what if there were some, some observers, some alien observers who wanted to study anthropology, and they're studying you, and they've, they can see everything you say and follow you around with their, their technology. What if these observers observed you for two weeks, Everywhere you went, every, everything you talked about, where you put your, your emotional energy. After two weeks, would the results show that you were primarily concerned with the kingdom of God? Or would the results show that you were primarily concerned with a lesser form of authority? My prayer for you is that this year that, that we don't let all of this noise distract you from what's most important. We want things in their proper place. Who is in power is important. But like, let's, let's flip this around just a little bit. If God's government is our primary concern, then we'll figure out how to relate to the government of whatever nation we happen to live in. We can figure all that stuff out. But this is our starting point. Jesus is Lord. And, and as I read through this, these passages in Timothy, 1 Timothy and in Romans, we have to watch our hearts and keep the authority in its proper place. God is the ultimate authority. And remember, first century Christians, they had no power. They had no voice. They had no vote. They didn't even have PR. And that movement subverted, overturned, flipped the Roman Empire on top of, uh, on its head. And think about the privileges you and I have. It's way more than the Roman Empire could have ever imagined. And as I look back through, through the history of the church, it seems like Jesus is really good at preserving the church, even when the culture grows hostile towards Jesus' followers. So I have a challenge for you based on this, this week, that, that you watch your posture this week when it, when it concerns who's in power. Are you, are you praying and interceding and thanking God and, and petitioning God on the, on the behalf of governmental authorities? I want to challenge yourself to remind yourself that God's kingdom is the most important. So to do that, I'm going to challenge you, before you watch news or you read news, I want you to confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord. And follow it up with, with a prayer from Jesus. Say, Lord, may your kingdom come and your will be done. So... Say, God, Jesus is Lord. And God, may your kingdom come and may your will be done. And watch what that does to your heart and, the, and even how, how excited you get. And this isn't about being stoic. This isn't about just being above emotion. No, Jesus wept. Jesus was passionate. I want us to be emotional and passionate about the right things. Again, like Paul said, not to be tossed to and fro by every wind and every doctrine I would say by extension, by every new news cycle or every new rage story. 
This is a time where we need to be clear-headed and we need to hear Jesus' voice loudly and that's the voice that needs to be loudest in our heads and in our hearts. So, I mentioned it before, I want, I, this isn't the final word. And what we're doing now, I want this to be the first word. And here in Southern California, in, in, in Rancho Cucamonga, we have groups that are meeting to hash out what this looks like. If you saw some of the titles or descriptions and, and you thought, ooh, politics, I wanna hear what, what Mike thinks about uh, this one issue. Pfft. My friend, you're in the wrong place. I'm not an expert on politics, I'm not an ethicist. I want this to be the, the discussion starter because at Solid Ground, we do this type of thinking and conversation in community. And I'm giving out the starting point and then we can discern that together. Uh, and we're, we're, we're going through, we have groups meeting all over the city going through this document called For the Health of the Nation that talks about some of the, the ballot issues and, and more importantly, what scripture has to say about some of these issues that our culture on the right and on the left, our culture's fighting and batting around these issues and scripture actually speaks to these. And uh, we're doing that in a face-to-face, -face, loving brother-sister uh, environment where we can hash some of this out. And so if you wanna join that and you live close enough, oh my goodness, come on and uh, um, reach out to us and uh, we'll find a group for you. And if you live further out, um, reach out to us and we'll, we'll figure out something. Uh, if you wanna discuss these things a little bit more and process these things a little bit more, reach out to us and we'll figure something out for you as well. So, my goodness. Until we're together again, I'm just praying peace over your life and may God bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you and may God give you peace. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen.